Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay. Let's get started. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome the <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jim. Uh, so uh, I think the title says it all. I'm going to talk about today about using Boolean, satisf Boolean satisfiability to do error detection of large software systems. And every talk has to begin with the motivation. And I have to admit that I've really struggled uh, to come up with the motivation for this talk. So I'll start out with the, the, the humorous one, and then I'll give you the real motivation sort of in the middle of the talk or a little bit later on after I've already shown you a little bit about what we're doing. But the kind of, pract the kind of uh, social motivation for the talk is that we've got, we've got a pointer that doesn't work. We've got two guys, OK? One of whom, I'm sorry, I don't point at the screen. I point at the machine. Yes, uh, an angry young man who needs a thesis and an old man who has recently changed jobs and needed a new project. And so we were sitting around talking about what we could do. And the thing that these two people have in common is that they're fairly experienced with static error detection. And in fact, uh, having spent time at Microsoft, between the three of us, having spent time at, substantial amount of time at Microsoft, Berkeley, and Stanford, we started hanging around uh, when a lot of the systems that have been built in recent years were built. Now, we didn't, of course, build all of these systems or have anything actually to do with some of these systems, but we were at least going to lunch with the people who were building these systems. And, <laughs> and actually, you often learn a lot more at lunch about uh, what's wrong with these systems than you do from reading the papers. So I think we had maybe some insight that other people didn't have. Um, about you know what the strengths and weaknesses were of all these different uh, efforts, and uh, an idea, and it's really Yi Chen's idea, uh, that he had been playing with actually for a couple of years um, in a somewhat different way, uh, was that SAT would be great in this domain. So he had started looking at this quite a while ago, but we decided to try uh, to to do it in a serious way, and use only Boolean satisfiability to analyze software. Okay, and the idea is we find more bugs, fewer false positives. And, and for this crowd, um, probably the most important thing, uh, we thought it'd be much easier to scale up, actually, using SAT than other approaches. And, and probably one of the things I want to try to get across in this talk is just how much easier this system was to build than a lot of the other systems that we've done in the past. I mean, the bang for the buck was, was considerably greater than, we, than either of us had seen previously. All right, so here's an example which will um, probably be really boring to several, to most of the people in this room. So if we want to uh, analyze for properties, and one of the properties we'll look at is the standard uh, locking property, okay, we can describe the desired behavior of a program on a lock as a finite state machine where uh, the locks and the unlocks must alternate. And if they do not alternate, then you go to some error state. And here's a little piece of code that um, actually observes that uh, protocol. So at first it locks the lock, and then it unlocks the lock. Now, so it locks and then unlocks, yeah. And, but the problem is that in real code, uh, of course, things aren't usually that nice. Uh, a lot of times, you'll have things done conditionally. So in the Linux kernel, there's this uh, primitive called the spin try lock, which only acquires the lock conditionally. So it tries to get the lock, and then it returns a, f a, a Boolean um, saying, or a flag saying whether or not it got succeeded in getting the lock. And in that case, you should only unlock if, in fact, you succeed in acquiring the lock in the first place. So this is a typical example of a, pa of a path sensitive use of, of locks. Okay? And so in order to um, do what we want to do, uh, we have to be able to be at least flow sensitive. Okay? So we have to be able to respect the order of operations. Um, we also have to be path sensitive. We have to be able to keep track of predicates that guard uh, certain operations. Okay? Um, we have to deal with pointers in the heap. Okay, so we have to. So this is a very, very common actually to have locks held in structures and, and through relatively complicated 
uh, addressing and dereferencing operations. And we need to be inter interprocedural because, of course, these things are being passed in from the outside. And so there's information that has to flow through the entire program, not just locally within a single procedure. And this stuff is probably all mom and apple pie to everybody here. I'm sure that everybody here has seen uh, examples of this many times. OK. So what is Saturn? So Saturn is a SAT-based approach to static bug detection. You probably already figured that out um, from the earlier slides. And how do we actually do this? OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to translate program constructs into Boolean constraints. Okay? And then inference, the actual computation of the properties that we're interested in, is going to be done by SAT solving, or rather queries. So we're going to ask queries of these formulas and ask if they're satisfiable under certain circumstances. Okay? And here's the real motivation, or the technical motivation for the talk. So why should SAT be good for this? Okay? And the main, uh, and we, and as I said, we struggled somewhat to come up with a good explanation for people for this. But after a lot of thinking um, and trying to you know, put our intuition into words, I think the number one thing is to delay abstraction. So in program analysis, if there's a, in the history of program analysis, if you look at where people have made progress, it's often when they find a way to delay making decisions. Okay? So de demand-driven analysis is often better than computing all the analysis up front. Because when you have the query, the actual fact you're interested in learning, you delay the decision about what it is you're going to compute until you know that query. Then you can focus just on that query, do it much more efficiently, and therefore use a more expensive algorithm because you're only focusing on one query instead of trying to compute all the facts in the world. That's a way of delaying decisions. Okay? Um, another way of delaying decisions is to delay abstraction. So a lot of systems say a type-based system when they see an integer in the program, they will immediately take that integer and they will abstract it from the concrete integer to an int. Okay? And most of the time, that's fine. For most applications, that's, that's completely fine. But every now and again, you might actually care that that integer was zero. All right? But to pay the cost of always concretely representing those integers all right, for all possible analyses is, is a very, very expensive. Okay? But you're forced into this decision where you throw away some information immediately without knowing actually what the, what the fact was that you were going to need in order to prove the property of interest. And so SAT is going to allow us to delay abstraction. Basically, intra-procedurally, we're going to have almost no abstraction. We're going to represent the computation almost completely faithfully. And I'll show you what I mean by that as we go along. And we're only going to lose information at function boundaries. At function boundaries, we're very consciously going to perform abstraction. But that's the only place we're going to do it. All right? And the intuition why that's OK is that that's the natural abstraction boundary anyway. That's the abstraction boundary the programmer put into the program. And so probably the interface for the function, whatever it is, is already a lot simpler than whatever the behavior was inside the function. And so now that's a little bit fuzzy, but from, from, an, from our experience, this actually works out quite well. That function boundaries are good places to abstract. And, and inside the function, by keeping much more information around, we, we do a lot better. Okay, so we'll see some examples of this as we go along. All right, so now down to uh, nuts and bolts. How do we actually do this? So here's a piece of straight line code. This, I must warn you, is completely original, uh, designed to allow the example to fit on one slide. Okay, so this is not a piece of code that anybody would care about. But what we're going to do is we're going to make uh, z be the bitwise and of x and y, and then we're going to have an assert that z is equal to x. Okay, so how do we represent this? Well, what we do is we build a Boolean formula that actually represents the circuit you would write if you were implementing this uh, in the obvious way with wires and, and signals. So we have 32 bits for x, simulating a 32-bit machine. These are 32 Boolean variables, one for each bit uh, of, the, of the integer variable x. 32, 32 Boolean variables for y. Put those into a circuit, which is a bitwise AND. So build a formula, which is the bitwise AND uh, of x and y. Okay, and so we get out another, uh, now a, a representation of z, which is 32 Boolean formulas. So each bit here can be represented by an arbitrary Boolean formula. Okay, and then the assert is to check that the original 32 Boolean variables is equal to the 32 Boolean expressions, uh, are, are um, point-wise equal to the 32 Boolean expressions uh, for z. Okay, and that gives us, sorry, uh, an expression R, which represents this entire body. Okay? And then to know whether this assert actually holds or not, what we will do um, is asking us, is it possible 
that R, is there some world in which R is not satisfied? So is there some substitution for the variables that will mean that R is not satisfied? So could, is there some set of inputs for X and Y that will make that assertion fail? Okay. And yes. So how well do inequalities and ranges work in this world? How, like, if I test that this variable is greater than that, what is that? Is that easy to represent? We build a circuit for greater than or equal. That's not hard to do. I mean, we have to represent integer addition as a full ripple carry adder. Okay, we actually just lay out the circuit for a ripple carry adder and, and plug that in. So, you know, for certain kinds of addition, we represent it very, very precisely. Now, there are operations. And I, went, I had that, you know, so I had a little parenthetical comment, almost no abstraction in the, <laughs> in the function bias. There are, you know, SAT is not all of computation. So there are some operations that are not easy to represent as Boolean formulas. So we don't do a great job with modular arithmetic, for example. So if you do, you know, arbitrary mod, we don't do a great job with shifts. All right, if you shift by a constant, that's fine. If you shift by some variable, that's not so easy to represent as a finite circuit, okay? If you uh, do floating point arithmetic, all right, we don't do a great job with those. But, but to a first approximation, for most primitive operations, we do a far better job of representing them precisely than most uh, than most analyses do. Yeah. Maybe this question is a little early, but it seems to fit into some of it now. Um, uh, how about uh, dynamic, mem dynamic memory allocation? Uh, how do you how do you do that? With we'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay. And if I don't answer it, you know, ask me again. All right. And I'll and I'll avoid the question again when you. When you <laughs> Huh? We don't build a full circuit division. Um, we could, in principle, do it for multiplication, and we don't at the moment. Okay. Yeah. So we we haven't found that to be important. So so the reality is that we what we have done is we have gone and implemented precisely those that we found. You know, that's, it, this has been being built incrementally. So each time we do a new application, we take a few more operations and implement them precisely. Um, so so. So we've got most of them actually implemented. There's more that we could do. There's some that we just, you know, realistically, you're not going to be able to represent precisely. Yeah. Right. Uh, you actually can represent all the operations. It's just a question of if it's really. Uh, well, that's, no, some of these algorithms, some of these primitive operations are, are actually iterative. So, like, you know, floating point division is a very complicated algorithm. Well, it's okay. So <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I mean, all right, well then let's, then let's, you know, go to the, you know, so the transcendental functions and some other things, you know, they're sometimes built in. I mean, there are some, you know, so, yeah, okay, they're all over fine things. So we could, in principle, do that, you're right, with some of these. Yeah, but we're not going to, you know, we have not tried to do that. Some of them are prohibitively expensive representative of the lean formula. Once you choose not to represent, do yeah. you just represent them as uninterpreted functions? Is that what you do? Uh, that what we do generally, well, well, because of the notion, you'll have to see what our goal is. Okay, so we're not doing verification, we're doing bug finding. So we want to reduce false positives. So generally what we do then is we decouple, there's no connection between the inputs and the outputs. There's fresh Boolean variables for the outputs, and so there's no information flow across that um, particular from primitive, which will allow it to be satisfiable more often, which will decrease the number of times the complement of the formula is satisfiable, which will reduce the number of false positives. So basically, you know, cut that path out and don't allow uh, any false positives. So that actually is really interesting, if you don't mind. My well, I'm happy for you to say that. Say it again. <laughs> I thought you were gonna. I thought you got the heckling no, ticket. So. <laughs> Other approaches to program analysis that I'm aware of, typically, if you drop some, foot, right, it can lead to problems in both directions. It can lead to missing bugs because you miss some flow. It can also lead to false positives. Like suppose something was incremented in some function and you didn't see that, right? And that would then help you resolve the problem. Would you? I think what you're claiming here is that because you have these Boolean variables and the decouple and the satisfiability thing you just said, is it always the case that it will only be permissible? No, no, it won't. No, it may. We, we, we may. Uh, we, so, we're, so the goal is there is to reduce false positives. Okay, we may also increase the number of false negatives, but false negatives generally don't bother the users too much. Yeah, so you okay. see, technically, your approach of uh, decoupling those things when you don't know what you're having inside, they will never create or not. That's correct. It will only be minimized. Yeah, I believe that is correct. Yeah. Okay. So we ask, is this uh, query um, satisfiable? Is, it, is there some state in which this assertion is not satisfied? So you probably don't remember what the assertion was anymore. 
But I'll just tell you that this was an artificial example, and it was set up so, yeah, there was some trivial examples where this assertion wasn't satisfied. And one thing about set solving is that it will actually supply you with an assignment to the variables that tell you what it was. So in principle, you, well, they, it'll just come up with an assignment saying, yeah, this thing is satisfiable. And we only use the one-bit fact, whether it's satisfiable or not. We don't actually keep track of the counterexample in our current uh, system. Okay, so therefore the assertion may fail, and that means at runtime that that property might not hold. Okay, so here's our initial approach. And what I'm going to tell you about today is two applications that we did. And then I will, um, at the end, talk about some of the current work that we're doing just very briefly. So our initial approach is we're going to assume a program is loop-free. What I mean by that is we make it loop-free. So we unroll the loops a couple of times, throw away the back edges, and voila, loop-free programs. Okay? So uh, what that means is that we're going to miss some errors that are deeply buried. And uh, so we're doing bug finding and not verification. And the, there's, um, there's, a, there's a bug finding motivation for this, is that it does have the advantage of being simple and, and reducing false positives. And we do the same thing with recursive functions, by the way. Mutually recursive functions, we just break the recursion arbitrarily, get a, get a program that doesn't have any, um, any looping of any form in it. And uh, the engineering advantage here um, is that it allowed us to get this project off the ground without having to think about fixed points in, uh, and, what, how, and, and figure out what that means when you're dealing with Boolean formulas. Because it's actually a fairly subtle thing. Right? You have a symbolic representation and detecting convergence um, can be tricky. Right? But uh, this is always uh, a shortcut to get going. And the plan, and actually we're pursuing this plan now, is to go back and fix this and extend the system to something that does sound analysis. Right. So I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the talk. But for the purposes of this talk, everything you're going to see here is, uh, is de definitely just bug finding. So trying to uh, find as many bugs as possible and not worry about uh, too much about false negatives. Okay, so control flow. Uh, what do we do here? Well, first thing we do, uh, we transform the program into a control flow graph. Okay. And now every um, statement um, is going to be guarded by the condition, uh, by a Boolean condition under which that statement actually executes. So remember, first of all, that these are all, we can assume that our, loop our, our function bodies are all uh, loop free, and so we have basically a finite function in there um, that allows us, or, or sorry, a, a finite program. Uh, I'm not even saying the right words. We have a, a, okay, so loop free is probably the best expression. I'm looking for a synonym and, and it's escaping me. So we have you know, something that could be exploded into straight line code if we wanted to. And so we can actually enumerate the conditions on each statement. Right. So uh, each statement is going to have a guard, okay, and a state associated with it. All right, so for example, uh, x uh, will have the value of a, will have the 32 Boolean expressions associated with uh, the, the, the bits of a uh, under if c is true. Okay, so if this test is true, then this will be the state of the program. On the other hand, if uh, C is not true, okay, then X is going to have the uh, Boolean expressions um, uh, associated with the bits of B. All right? And then it merges um, because we want to maintain a fully path-sensitive analysis. Right? What we're going to do, uh, first of all, the guards are merged uh, at, at joins. Okay? And actually, uh, if you don't do something smart about these guards, your uh, set solver will be very unhappy uh, later on. So we actually do a little bit of smarts here to fold together uh, guards that annihilate each other. So we'll actually know that that guard is true. And then for the values of uh, the value of x, what is the expression for x? Well, each bit of x, so each vi, is going to be this Boolean expression. All right, it's going to be ai if c is true, All right? And it's going to be uh, bi if not c is true, All right? We actually build that for every um, bit at every merge, okay? So this preserves path sensitivity, and we select which bit uh, is based on the values of the incoming cards. Right. Now, what about pointers? So we're getting closer, we're gradually getting closer to your question here, All right? Um, although I think I can answer your question now. Since our programs are loop-free and recursion-free, you only have a finite number of allocations, right? You have a fix, so we just represent, this one advantage that it gives us is we can represent every bit of the heap in the entire execution, 
right? So every bit can be can be given uh, its own identity. All right. Now, so uh, so pointers might point to different locations. Okay. So each points two sets. This is a standard thing. So a pointer might point to a, a bunch of different locations. Okay. Uh, however, um, we also want our heap to be path sensitive. Okay. So the guards. We also have guards on the point relationships. So a points to relationship is going to be written like this. It's a set of guarded locations. So saying that the pointer P will point to L1 if the guard G1 is true. Okay? So for every possible location it can point to, there's a Boolean guard associated with that. All right? And since there's only a finite number of locations in the program, we just enumerate them all. Okay? And, uh, and there's one special uh, location which is null. Okay, with its own guard, saying under what condition the pointer can point to null. Okay. okay, so here's an example with pointers. So let's say that uh, P um, points to the address of X. So the analysis will say, well, the guard for that is true. This statement always executes, at least in the fragment that we see here. And P also unconditionally points to X after the execution of that statement. Okay. Now, then under some condition, we change P to point to Y, all right? So if C is true, then P points to Y. Well, so this statement here has the guard C. This statement only executes if C is true. And when this statement executes, P unconditionally points to Y, okay? So there's two levels of guards here. There's a level of guard on what's true of the heap at this point in time, and there's, a, and there's the condition under which we reach this program counterpoint, all right? Now at the merge, that's where stuff moves around. So the guards here, the guard on this statement is going to be true again because we've had the, the, the two paths, uh, the, the, the missing else branch here and the true then branch of that conditional have merged together. So we reach this point uh, always, so the guard for that is true. And now we merge together the two states uh, that the heap could be in. So P will point to Y if C is true and it will point to X if not C is true. Okay. So this is exactly the same thing we did with the uh, values of variables. They were guarded. Okay, it merges. And now we just do the same thing for the heap. So for every pointer into the heap, we keep track of the condition under which the pointer will point into a certain location. Yes? So I'm following. The way you got C and not C was really that was C and true and not C and true. And you just did a simplification. That's how you convert. You've got the C and... Yeah, that's correct. That's correct, yeah. This is already, yeah, I, I, this is pre-simplified here, so it fits on the line. That's exactly right. Yeah. So can I ask the second question now? Sure. So there's a paper, I know this works, right? But the thing that blows my mind is that not just is this brute force that you're representing every bit, but by my intuition, you're doing it in the most inefficient way possible. So you think about, you're walking along the path, and there's a bunch of predicates that guard that path, and all the facts of that path. Yeah. And instead of taking advantage of that factory, you're taking all those predicates and pushing them down to every bit of every factory, right? Well, it's not quite that brute force, okay? There's a couple of tricks um, that are extremely important. Um, so one, well, one of them's already been, uh, one, uh, one yes and one no, so I'll, but I'll mention it now. So one is uh, folding the guards together here. So this prevents the guards from piling up. All right, so you can imagine that if you were to explode, you know, your DAG of your program graph into a full tree, you know, then the naive algorithm would be, you know, every decision piles up more and more and more guards. And you definitely see that, okay? If you don't simplify the guards, you get, you know, overwhelmed by combinations of, 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 of all the different things that the if statement says. So simplifying the guards is very important, okay? And we, and we do that. Um, the second thing that is important is that when it comes around to doing actual queries, Okay. Let's say you want to know whether a given lock is in the held state on exit from a function. This is a typical kind of query we might ask for analyzing locks. All right. So we actually do a form of slicing at that point. We go and say, well, what are the bits for the lock? Okay. We get the final bits for the final state of the lock. And then what did that depend on? Okay. Well, that depended on some other bits. And what did that depend on? So we don't pull in the entire Boolean formula for the, for the entire function. We only, we do a kind of dependency analysis to only pull in the portions of the expressions that are relevant to that actual query. Okay, so that's a kind of 
late finding or or delaying the decision about what actually is going to what actually is going to what expression we're actually going to you know, send to the send to the SAT solver, and that's extremely important. If we don't do that, then then we don't then we're not able to analyze lots of functions. But one thing we are depending on here, okay, and you're right. I mean, this is definitely a brute force approach, uh, and 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 but the reason that we can get away with that and and the, and the brute force nature of it actually is one of the things that makes it easy to build, okay. Um, is that we're relying on the fact that functions are of a certain finite size. I mean, people tend to write functions that won't exceed a certain size. We only, this only has to work up, this part of it only has to work up to a certain size formula. Okay, whatever the size of the largest expected function body would be. Now, that does imply that this may not work as well for auto-generated code. Okay, because if you look at auto-generated code, uh, sometimes people generate very large function bodies. Okay. But even auto-generated code tends to conform to this because, you know what, compilers make exactly the same assumption that function bodies are not too large. And whenever anybody has gone off and written a compiler or, a, or some sort of tool that auto-generated code with function bodies that were too large, they were badly bitten by all the compilers that would not compile it in a reasonable amount of time because of the quadratic register allocation algorithms, for example. All right? So this assumption that functions are of a fixed size has already been kind of beaten into the world by, by compilers for us. All right? It's both a human human it's both a human factors issue and just the way people architect compilers has kind of forced the world to adhere to this, and so we find that this actually works pretty well. And the failure rates we actually don't analyze every single function successfully, but our failure rates are less than one percent, right? and that's only because um, and, and that's only because we haven't done the engineering to try to get the last one percent. We, we we had a conscious goal to get it below one percent, and then we stopped. Failure means that the test already. Actually, the failures mean that the whole system failed to analyze one particular function, okay? And it's never been the SAT solver that was the bottleneck there. It was always our optimizations, okay, to try to keep the SAT things under control for the SAT solver. And in fact, what we've done over time is moved a few more things back into the SAT solver. We were probably too aggressive. We were, you know, we, we were too worried about the SAT solver um, getting overwhelmed. And we've actually found that we were able to move a few things back into the SAT solver and out of our simplification of conditionals and, and you know, dependencies, our graph dependent slicing and things like that. Um, there's a couple of other tricks that I haven't explained that are, that are really specific to particular program constructs that, that, you know, that where we've, we've actually found we can get rid of those and, and, and not, not rely on those or let the SAT solver deal with it. Okay? So I think with more engineering we could get we could, we could push that to 99.9% .9 or 99.99%, but we just haven't done that. Okay. All right. So then, um, where was I? Oh, yes. So now let's say we want to assign a dereference of P into a result, okay, into some variable res. Um, so this is actually interesting. Um, not that the rest of it isn't interesting, but this is even more interesting and some of the rest. So how do we do this? Well, so we're actually analyzing a function body forward, okay, building up the expression as we go. So we actually know what this points to set looks like at the point where we reach this assignment. Okay, so we're actually, because we're, we're analyzing in control flow order. So here's a little trick. So rather than build a special purpose uh, analysis for star p, we actually rewrite it as this piece of code which is a conditional assignment. We look at the points to, kind of guarded points to sets we have, and we just write that out as a, form, as, a, as, a, as a program saying, well, if C is true, then res is going to be Y, else if not C is true, res is going to be X. Okay? We just, we just take the guarded points to set and translate it into this conditional assignment. And because we're doing a good job with, um, with the heap and pointers and path sensitivity and all that, this will be analyzed completely precisely and give us the right answer. Is it true that the guards of the points to set tend to be disjoint? They tend to be disjoint. They don't have to be. Because, like I said, there are a few primitives we don't analyze completely accurately. All right, so for example, if you say, you know, x mod 3 is 0 in your predicate, well, then your guards aren't going to come out disjoint. But usually they are disjoint, in fact. Yeah. How do you handle pointer parameters to functions? How is the points to set? We'll talk about that when we get to functions. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So I'm 10 slides into a 40-slide talk at half an hour. So we're going to speed up just a little bit, you know, from here on out. All right. <laughs>
So, oh, right, wrong way. Okay. So, all right. So, just to recap later, so we have these garden location sets. So, it's a, it's a bunch of locations with Boolean guards. And the guard is the condition under which the points to relationship holds. And those are collected from the guards on statements. And then at a point of dereference, we translate it into a conditional assignment and analyze that. All right. So, there's a bunch of other constructs I'm not going to talk about. I won't talk about how we deal with structs. Um, basically, every other construct, you take the same brute force mentality and and just do it in the way that, uh, that we've been doing these. Okay? So for a struct, for example, you know, if you have a struct with 10 fields, each of which has 32 bits, we have 320 var Boolean variables for that struct, okay, for every instance of that struct. Uh, how we model the environment, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I can be happy to talk about that offline with anybody who's interested in it. And then there's optimizations. So I said there are several optimizations to reduce the size of formulas. And as I said, some form of program slicing is important when you actually get around to doing queries. All right, so now let's actually look at an application. So let's come back to locking. So we have lock and unlock, right? So how are we going to analyze this? Um, so here's our little state machine. All right, review. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the same kind of trick we use with pointers to encode state machines in the program. So uh, when you have a lock, what we're going to try, well, the way we're going to represent the lock operation is we're going to add a, uh, a ghost field to the, uh, the lock structure L called its state. And we're going to track the state ourselves. Okay. And so a, a lock operation would represent as the following conditional assignment. If the state is in the unlock state, then we move, then we change the state to the lock state. Otherwise, the state goes to the error state. And similarly uh, for the unlock operation. And then again, because we're doing the path sensitive analysis and all the structs and all that stuff um, precisely, this just does the right thing. Okay? That gives us exactly the behavior that we want. Okay? So in general, for, a, uh, for an arbitrary finite state machine, you encode the states as integers, and then the, then the transitions will be encoded as conditional assignments. And then to check the code behavior, you should queries. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, all right, what kinds of queries we do. I think we'll talk about that. All right, so how are we doing so far? Okay, so precision, all right, you know, two thumbs up. This is, uh, this is about as precise as you could want, probably, maybe uh, more precise than, than you would like. Uh, uh, but you know, we're doing pretty well, arguably, on precision. For scalability, um, this strategy actually is completely doomed, um, at least as what I've explained to you so far. Because what I forgot to tell you is that Boolean satisfiability is an exponential problem, at least as far as anybody knows. And so uh, even though SAT solvers have improved tremendously thanks to uh, you know, uh, great new algorithms discovered over the last 10 years and the fact that machines are 10,000 times faster than they were uh, 15 years ago. Um, but the current limit for SAT solvers is about a million clauses, which if you take this kind of brute force approach, is going to be about 10 medium-sized functions. So that's about how big a uh, program you could analyze just doing what I've told you about so far. So our solution to this um, is going to be to do exactly what um, type inference systems do for those people who are aware of type inference systems. And if you're not aware, then I won't mention those again. We're basically going to do a divide and conquer strategy where we're going to summarize each function. All right, so we are interested ultimately in particular properties. The analysis of the function bodies up to now is completely general. It could be used for any property at all because it's representing everything faithfully. And in function summaries, what we're going to do is we're just going to pick out the relevant behavior for the particular property we're analyzing. Summarize the function. The idea is that by doing that, we will get a small summary, something that remains relatively constant as we move up the call graph of the program. If those summaries are in fact small, then this should scale because we should be able to take small summaries, use them in the callers. Because they're small, they won't have much impact on the analysis of the callers, and their summaries will in turn be small and so on, up to the root of the brain. All right, so let's try to do function summaries. Okay, and this will also illustrate the kinds of queries we do. So here's a function. Okay, here's our first tried function summary. So what we want to do uh, for a finite state machine property is summarize um, the program's behavior with a set of state transitions. Okay, so the summary we would like for this particular uh, function is the following one. So we say that, um, that star L is a lock and it can move from the, this function will move it from the unlock state to the unlock state. So if the function starts in the unlock state with, with star L in the unlock state, then it will terminate with star L in the unlock state. Okay? 
And if it starts with star L in the lock state, then it will produce an error. And that summarizes the function's behavior on that particular lock. You can believe that this written out is a Boolean formula, which is the way we do it. And this is the human readable, this is just human readable syntax for the talk. That this would be a relatively small formula, okay? Also, you can see that because this is a finite state property, we only have a finite set of states, therefore a finite set of possible transitions, that these summaries are bounded in size. Okay, so they can't get out of hand. Right? And the way we compute these summaries is we take the entire Boolean formula for this function body, and then we just ask it queries, one for each state. If the lock is in the unlocked state initially, what are the possible final states? Okay, so basically the way we do that is take every possible pair of initial and final states, Take the formula, say, is it possible that this thing can start in the unlocked state, terminate, say, in the locked state, and you get back true or false? Okay, we just do that for every pair of states, every possible combination of input and output states, and from that we get the transition matrix. From that we build a small Boolean formula telling us what the thing does. Okay, so there's a lot of SAT queries that we do. I mean, sometimes hundreds of SAT queries depending on the property. So there's no condition to well, well, that's our second try. Okay, so, so you're, you're, you're stealing my story, which is that this is a bad idea, okay? We're going to have to do more than this, all right? So, okay, yeah. Also, what about aliasing if you have multiple pointer parameters? Oh, we ignore aliasing of pointer parameters. In this version, yeah, that's the, so the two primary sources of, sorry to interrupt you, two primary sources of unsoundness in the stuff I'm talking about now are the handling of loops and the handling of interprocedural aliasing. Okay, intra-procedural aliasing we model precisely, but in the summaries that I'm talking about here, we don't take into consideration the possible aliasing inter-procedurally at all. You don't even assume that the parameters of the function could be aliased to the stack slots in the function. No, we assume everything that comes in is unaliased. Every external, every pointer that originated outside the function body is not aliased to any other pointer. Okay, that's our, that's, that's how this stuff is set up. All right. All right. Okay, so here's a little problem, all right? So you see code like this a lot of the time. So if you have, so this thing gets the lock. Uh, if there's an error somewhere in the middle, uh, the function just quits with a, with a returning a, an error flag. And, and most importantly here, it does not unlock the lock. Um, if everything proceeds normally, it unlocks the lock and returns zero. Okay, so this is very, very common. Um, it would, and what the, the implicit contract here is that in the case of an error, it's the caller's job to clean up and, and take care of uh, releasing the lock. All right. Now, technically, the problem here is that we have two possible outset state, output states, which are distinguished only by the return value. And in this case, um, the predicate that we would, uh, that I will introduce here, is that they're distinguished by whether or not the return value is zero. In one case, one indicates normal termination, the other indicates abnormal termination. Oh, constantly. So here's the actual summary we would like to have. And this is exactly what Monavir um, was guessing would be needed, uh, which is that we need um, some kind of guard on these transitions. So in fact, this is the summary that we actually do compute. So if the return value is zero, right, then you have this transition relationship. And if the return value is non-zero, then you have this transition relationship. Okay. Now, how do we do that? All right. So what we do, uh, here's our model for function summaries. So there's some set of input predicates and some set of output predicates. And for those people who work on predicate abstraction, these predicates are serving the kind of the same role as the predicates and predicate abstraction, except these are provided by the user. Right, so this is actually part of the design of the analysis, is that the user or the design analysis designer decides on a fixed set of predicates that are going to be used uh, in the construction of the function summaries. And these can be predicates either on the input state of the function or on the output state. Okay. And then R is a uh, transition relationship, all right? or the set of states, I'm sorry. R is the set of states. Okay? Yes? The actual predicates. That's what we currently do. That's part of the spec of the analysis. Yeah. How do you want to construct function summaries? You have to say, what, what are the important distinguishing predicates for the, for the entry of the function and the outputs? We don't actually, so this avoids having to do predicate abstraction at all. Right? And so far, we found it very easy to find these predicates, and we don't actually need very many predicates. Okay. Um, and part of the reason for that is that we're, that we're doing a good job intra-procedurally. I mean, we're basically 
keeping track of all possible predicates intra procedurally anyway. All right, so it's only how you want to abstract that at the function boundary that needs to be specified. Okay, um, so Saturn is going to compute the set of guarded state transitions, and that's used to simulate the, the function behavior at the call site. All right, so here's our second try at, at summaries. So the actual uh, locking analysis is done as, as follows. So we have an out one output predicate, uh, which is whether the return value is zero or not. Okay, now how do we find that? So we took our initial first try function summaries, okay? We ran the analysis once. The results were absolutely terrible, okay? We went and looked at why they were terrible. We discovered that people often conditionally hold locks or not, depending on whether the return value is zero or not. We had that one predicate. We ran it again. Everything was fine. Okay, and that's actually what happens. Right? So, so it's the usual way you would find this kind of thing by tri trial and error. Right? Uh, and we have no input predicates in this case. And so then we get this summary. Okay, so now how do the queries work? Well, for every combination of input and output predicates, you, you ask all possible queries about input and output states. All right? So for every combination of input, output uh, predicates and input and output states, ask whether that's satisfiable. Okay, and if it is, that results in a guard state transition. If it's not, that's not in the summary at all. Okay. All right, so here's our lock checker for Linux. Um, the exp we did this on, on the Linux kernel, uh, so it's about, which currently has about 5 million lines of code. Uh, there's 40 uh, lock, unlock, and try lock primitives that we had to teach the system about. And it took about 20 hours to do the analysis on a, on a single processor. Um, and, and part of the scalability here I should just mention is that we actually use a database, um, a, real, a real database to write the summaries out to disk. So we analyze, we, we analyze one function at a time, compute the summary, commit that to disk, and then bring in the next function. So we don't have, it, so it's, it, I know you guys already do that kind of thing where you worry about um, secondary storage. Um, but we don't do something where we have to keep everything in RAM at once. All right. Okay, so here's some, some of the errors that we find. So typical, there's two kinds of errors that we find with this analysis. Uh, one is uh, double locking. So here's, you know, acquire the lock and then conditionally call another uh, function and that acquires the same lock. And under certain, if you compile the Linux kernel in a particular way uh, with multiprocessor support, um, this will actually deadlock the kernel. So, and the other one we find uh, is an ambiguous return state, okay? So this is one that's a little um, subtler maybe. It's a, this is a case where the lock, the state of the final state of the lock is actually not determined by the input and output predicates that you supplied for the analysis. The analysis discovered in the process of performing all these queries that the final state of the lock was not completely done by the, by the set of predicates supplied in the analysis design. All right, and these are classed as bugs, okay? And so in this case, here's another you know, set of primitives. So you acquire the lock. Um, then you, uh, if something bad happens, then you release the lock and you return you know, some flag. Okay? Uh, but then later on in the same function, uh, you just return the same value without uh, doing the up. Okay? So there's two possible ways to return here with a non-zero uh, non uh, return value one of which uh, leaves, which leave the locks in different states. Okay, so that will be, that will be flagged as an error. All right, so then, uh, sorry. So here are the results. Okay, so in the Linux kernel, we found 179 um, bugs, uh, which break down in this way between the double locks and the ambiguous uh, return states. And then this is separately the number of false positives. So this is not, you should add these two numbers for the total number of reports. Okay. And so then there's the percent, this will give you an idea of the false positive rate. And one of the reasons we picked this particular application is because there were two previous studies of locking in the Linux kernel that we could compare with. So there was one in the original uh, Metal checker, and then there was one in SQL. Uh, so Metal found 31, um, uh, I think it was only double locking errors. And SQL found an additional 18 because these 31 had been fixed by the time the SQL SQL experiments were done. Uh, and the false positive rates here were, were over 80% for those particular analyses. Now these numbers here, I wouldn't compare these two directly here because um, 
I mean, because these were very, these were fairly early systems, and and I think false positive rates in general have dropped quite a bit. And so, you know, one could build a non-SAT-based analysis today that did quite a bit better than these. But still, this is, uh, I think, for the bang for the buck again. I I think this this is really a lot of errors found relatively easily, and some of which are definitely not um, going to be found. Uh, in these other frameworks because of the, uh, the path sensitive nature and, and some of the other things that are going on. Right. Okay, so the other thing we get out of this, which is kind of fun, is a function summary database. So you basically have signatures for every single function describing the locking behavior. Okay, so here are some statistics on Linux. So there are 63,000 functions in Linux of which more than 23,000 deal with locks in some way. Okay, meaning either themselves or some function they call. Uh, Locks. And so 17,000 uh, have actual locking constraints on empty and on entry. I mean, they assume locks are in a particular state when the function starts. And 9,000 affect more than one lock. And then there's uh, lock wrappers and, lo and, and unlock wrappers, meaning functions that, that just uh, uh, that, that have the same signature as the lock or unlock function, but are not themselves the primitive lock or unlock functions that we, um, that we found. And there's only 36 that actually have a return value in lock state correlation, all right? But those 36 are called all over the place. They're used in lots and lots. They tend to be, they're the, the lowest level and most commonly used functions. And so not dealing with the return states would result in a lot more, a lot of false positives. Okay? And so this is actually posted on the Saturn website if, uh, if you want to take a look. All right, so I had planned to talk about another checker. And I will now compress this part of the talk into five minutes, all right, so that we can. Um, you can go a little longer than that. Huh? You can go a little longer. I can. People aren't getting bored by looking at all this stuff. All right. So okay. So we'll talk about memory leaks a little bit, and maybe I'll go a little longer. And so here's the motivation. Um, so, you know, when this is given as a standalone presentation talking about memory leaks, um, you know, it's an important problem. They still are hard. There are bugs that tend to linger in code a long time, and they're hard to find. Uh, the other reason for doing it from the point of view of this project is that it's a much more complicated property than locking. Okay? There's, if you look at the structure of the property and the kind of information you need, it's much more demanding than, than the locking analysis. So this was the next step to see, okay, maybe we're just locks. Okay, let's try something that's harder and see if we can do that. All right? And the other thing that's um, good is that a bunch of people have looked at, lo at, at, at escape analysis, sorry, at, uh, at leak uh, memory leaks before, and there's a variety of ideas out there, including experiments that we can compare to, right, that we can do comparison to. All right, so here's a simple leak. So what is, now this is to illustrate some of the issues in detecting leaks. So, um, so here is a, a really simple one. So you allocate something, okay, and on one path, uh, you return that, so that's not a leak. But on the error path, if something bad happens, you return null uh, and without deallocating that memory. So that memory is lost forever. Okay? So that's a typical, this is the basic cause of leaks or the kinds of leaks that we detect. Okay? I, shouldn't, I should point out that we don't detect every kind of memory leak. Uh, but basically, this is the kind of pattern where you've allocated something and then you, free, and then, and then you return no pointers to it. Okay? either within that function or within a small uh, range of functions that, that immediately surround that allocation function. All right, now, this one's relatively easy to find, but things get more complicated because you can have malloc wrappers, that is, functions that aren't called malloc that allocate memory. Okay? So there's a, there's a more interprocedural version of the previous problem where string dupe actually allocates something and then you drop the pointer to it later on. Um, now, but, but there are other ways for things not to be leaked. So, for example, you could allocate something and then store it in some uh, name that's accessible outside of the function. So here you had a structure that was passed in. Presumably the caller maintains pointer to that, uh, to that structure. And so here um, this memory is actually stored away. And so the fact that you return null there doesn't indicate a leak at all. You've, you've, maintained, you've held on to a reference that's still accessible from the rest of the program. There's an interprocedural version of that where there's some other function you call g that does that assignment. Right? And then here's probably the most complicated um, sort of thing, behavior that you see. Uh, here's a common optimization that's done. So uh, dynamic memory allocation is a slow operation. So malloc is one of the slowest things you can do, in, in at least if you're worried about high performance code. 
And so a lot of times people will um, do something like this where they have a statically allocated buffer, okay, or something that's at least allocated on the stack. And then they'll say, well, if the buff buffer size I need is small, then I can just use that pre-allocated buffer. Otherwise, I go off and do the slow thing and do an allocation to a, to a, to a malloc. Right? And then at the end of the function, you have uh, now a very subtle path-sensitive property where if P is not pointing to that other buffer, well, then you know you must have allocated something, in which case you need to free it. Okay? Okay, so that's the, that's the hardest one. Okay, so now what are the requirements here? So we need to track the points to relationships very precisely. Uh, the main reason that the memory leaks are harder is because we actually have to go into the heap. We have to know properties of the heap and what's pointing to what in the heap. Okay, so even if you've allocated something recently, you might be you know, building pointers to it, and those pointers to it might be the only references to that object. Okay, so we actually need to analyze what's going on in the heap in order to um, find leaks. Okay? Another thing, uh, and we need to infer the escaping functions. So we have to figure out which functions actually create external references to objects that are passed in via parameters. All right, so what do I mean by that? I mean, you allocate something in a function, and then you call another function with that newly allocated thing, right? And that function squirrels away the pointer in some global variable or global data structure, thereby guaranteeing that the pointer will continue to exist. Okay, as an escaping function, escapes one of its parameters. And then we have to figure out what are the allocation functions. Okay, so not every allocation function is called malloc. There are lots and lots of them. People write their own allocation functions that wrap malloc. Uh, and so we need to be able to know which object, which functions when we call them are actually allocating new memory. Okay, so here's, um, here's some of the ideas of how we do that. So we're going to find a function, first of all, which is points to, so the condition under which P points to L. And this is just another convenient, this is just a more convenient syntax for the guarded location sets, really. Right? So P points to L if the guard uh, on L is GI in the, in the, in a, in a points to set, in the, in the points to set for P. All right? Okay? So that's a shorthand that I'm going to use to refer to the guard location set. That gives me the guard under which a particular pointer points to a particular location. Now, okay, here's the nut of it, okay? And there's actually a whole bunch more Boolean formulas that I'm going to, going to spare you so you can thank me later uh, for doing that. But this is the important one that um, actually shows the, 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 the technically most uh, alluring aspects of this particular checker, okay? So how can a particular location escape? All right, we will say that a particular location escapes through another pointer P. All right, so for example, a location might escape through a global variable. A pointer is assigned to a global variable, then we'll say that, that location escapes through that global. All right, now escape via is a predicate, so it's going to give me back, it's going to be a Boolean formula. So I will say under what conditions a particular location escapes through a particular pointer, excluding references in set X. And for the moment, forget about that third argument. Okay, because that's going to be too, I'm going to give you the motivation for that at the very end, but we'll just ignore that. So for the, we're just going to make this a two-argument function for the purposes of discussion for the moment. How can a particular location escape through a particular pointer? All right. Now, uh, in order to, to give you this definition, we have to talk about different access routes. We have to talk about different classes of pointers. Okay, so we're going to care about, uh, so we're going to associate with every object uh, a route Okay, so which is the way it's accessed, first accessed in the function. And I won't tell you how we actually get that, but that's what it is. It's how the, how the, how the object is first accessed, okay? And there's five different classes of roots. There are parameters, formal parameters of the function. There's the return value of the function, global and local variables, and then the heap allocated objects, the newly allocated stuff. Do you try to do a lower bound or an upper bound? I'm sorry? They expect yes? to be a lower bound or an upper bound. I mean, the condition must be or if it's Ah, yes, yes. So is it upper bound or lower bound? Well, let me think. Um, no, it's not tight. So it's one or the other, okay? So, so yes, yeah, so the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> is it an upper bound or a lower bound? Um, yeah. Let's continue. I think it has to be, I think it has to be a, a, an upper bound. Oh, wait. wait. Well, that's what you mean by an upper bound and a lower bound, I guess. <laughs> Which way you think? 
Barbara. Right. It has to exclude. Yeah, we we are we're only computing things that we know to be true. All right. So we we're going to err on the side of if we're not sure that something escapes through a pointer, we will say false. Okay. So whether you consider that upper bound or lower bound. Lower bound. Okay. Lower bound. All right. All right. So things never escape through local variables. It's impossible to escape through a local variable because local variables go away when the function returns. Right. So. So the pointer to something cannot survive the lifetime of the function if it's only held on to through a local variable. Right. So how do we do that? So, we, so escape by a, so, so if p, if the root of p is a local, then L cannot escape through p. Uh, you always escape through global variables. Okay, so if the root of p is a global, then uh, L escapes through p exactly when p points to L. So the condition under which p points to L is the condition under which L will escape through P. Okay. Now, what about escaping through parameters and the return value? Well, uh, parameters and the return value definitely survive the function. The parameters are held onto by the caller. The return value is returned to the caller. So once again, something will escape through a parameter or the return value exactly when that pointer can point to that location. So if something is conditionally assigned to the return value, for example, and that's the only reference to it, that will be the points to condition under which that location actually survives the function, actually escapes from the function. All right, and now finally, here's where we actually use the third argument. Okay, so uh, let's say that something is newly allocated memory. All right, so under what condition will something whose root is newly allocated memory escape? Okay, well, so if, if the root of P is a newly allocated location, then L will escape via P exactly when P points to L. All right, so think about building up a list inside of a function. If I allocate something new and I cons it onto the list, okay, that, that newly allocated cell can only escape if that thing that points to it now, that I cons onto it, actually escapes. Okay, so, so first of all, um, P can escape, so L can escape through P only if P points to L, and in addition, P itself escapes. Ah, but there's a little tricky thing there. P better not escape through L itself. All right, so think about circular lists, like doubly linked lists. So we don't want to have a situation where we have mutually recursive constraints saying that L escapes if P does, and P escapes if L does. So if L escaping depends on P, and we want to figure out whether P escapes, then we need to know that P escapes, but not through L. Okay, and that's what the third argument is for. We say, look, we, don't, we want to know that P escapes, but through something other than the root of L, whatever that is. And this handles the case of, of uh, circular data structures, making sure that when we go to solve the constraints, that, there, that circularities don't imply more things escape than should. And believe it or not, this actually comes up in practice. You actually need that, that last clause. Okay. Does this incur any uh, uh, precision? I'm sorry. Does this incur any limitation in precision? Yeah, some. I mean, I think it does. I mean, because we're not we're not trying to figure we're not doing any shape analysis, for example. So we don't know cardinality of pointers and things like that. Okay. So this is all only what you can get through alias information. I mean, it's basically through intra-procedural alias information. That's the limitation. Okay, so then the escape condition, so we'll say that the location L escapes, um, uh, you know, through something other than some set X, uh, some set of roots X, if, uh, if, if any pointer, uh, if there's any pointer uh, that it can escape via, okay, excluding that set of roots X. All right, and then the leak condition, so then L leaks um, through something other than some set of roots X if it doesn't uh, escape through, uh, if, it, if it doesn't escape through something other than, uh, if it doesn't escape, um, <clears throat> if not escaped of L is true, all right? So there's no way for it to escape um, excluding the root sex. All right, so the leak checker um, is just asking, is it satisfiable for, for, some new, for every new location L, uh, there's gonna be a leak if it's satisfiable that that location leaks um, through, any, through any escape route, or through, well, so excluding no roots. Okay. All right. Now, there's other pieces to this. So we have to identify the malloc wrappers, as I mentioned, to identify the new locations. Because you, you see this piece here is in English. 
This is the only piece of math which I explained to you. And then we have this English stuff up here that still needs to be formalized. Okay, so we have to figure out what the new locations are. And then we have to figure out if new locations can escape through function calls. Okay, so we have to, we have to in our summaries, we have to capture whether a function escapes its parameters or not. And I'm just not, I'm just not going to show you the formulas for that. But those are similar, kind of along the same lines as the one I just showed you. Alex, are you literally just detecting malloc wrappers, or are you doing the more general thing, which is that I have a function where I call malloc, and then I trace it all the way up the call stack mm -hmm. as it's being passed up, and then yeah. things eventually... Yeah, no, it's, it's a much more semantic condition. So we, what we're detecting is that you know, something returns new memory, that memory doesn't escape except through the return value. Okay, so it's not assigning the memory someplace else. So, so the signature of, what, what's the signature of malloc? It returns freshly allocated memory. That memory does not escape except through the return value. Okay, and then there's a couple of other things I can't remember. Can bring this up arbitrarily. Yeah, comes up through function summaries. Yeah. Yeah. Missing some notion of the allocation. I'm sorry? In, in your leak condition, you're not missing some notion of the allocation. Oh, no, free, um, um, uh, free is just something that uh, escapes. Free is, free is a primitive, and it's, uh, it always escapes its parameter. It's an escaping function. So it always escapes its parameter. So anything that gets fed to free escapes and therefore does not leak. Okay. So we don't have to model free. Yeah. So actually, we got criticized for that in our paper. We forgot to mention free. But that's how it's done. <laughs> that's how it's done in the implementation. So yeah, a little oversight there for you know, memory allocation to, to a leak detection system. So we fixed that in the final version. All right. OK, so here are some results. Um, so here's a bunch of systems. Uh, here we try to pick things that are, that are either libraries that people use and don't understand or that are long-running systems where leaks might be an issue. Okay. And, and one of the reasons we picked this one is because there's these, these numbers in blue are the results from previous studies on the same version and how many leaks they found. So here you can see you know, over the one and a half million lines of code roughly found um, you know, hundreds of leaks, and the false positive rates are, are very low here. Okay. And that's because we're only going after a very restricted class of leaks. I mean, that's part of the reason the false positive rates are so low. And the other reason is because of all the precision in the, in the interpreter. It's still an amazingly small number of the false positive rate. Yeah. 3% is nothing. Right. Yeah, it's low. It's low. Okay. So, Alex, do you know? Yeah. How often this leaking is a local kind of thing versus how often it's, it's going all the way up to call stack some levels and then... We have that information. I don't think we have actually, we have, but we haven't examined that in detail. That's a good question. We could find that out pretty easily. Uh, a lot of them are non-local. A lot of them are not within a single procedure, that's for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And some of these are security holes, too, that we found. And, uh, so. All right. Um, so let me mention this one. Actually, there's one other interesting thing about this one, which I didn't do a slide on. Uh, so as part of this, you notice that I said the running time of this whole system was on the order of a, of a day. Um, you know, so it takes 20 hours to analyze the Linux kernel. This took uh, 20. Um, that, actually, that, that 20 hour number is actually old. The system has gotten somewhat faster since then. Um, this thing, which is much more intensive, took over tw takes over 24 hours, uh, even with the improvements we made. So one of the things Yi Chen did, um, as much to help our own uh, test debug cycle as anything else, was to write a parallel version of this. And so what we actually do is uh, we schedule, since each function is analyzed independently, uh, subject only to dependencies in the call graph, we topologically sort the call graph and then use a cluster of workstations running the analysis to farm out uh, the analysis. And within a cluster of 80 machines, um, we can get this down to 50 minutes. We can do the whole thing in 50 minutes. Yeah, we can do, uh, sorry, with a cluster of 50 machines, we can do this, run this leak checker on the Linux kernel in 50 minutes. And I don't have the numbers here for the kernel. Can you use parallel like SAT solvers and let them do this? That's not the bottleneck. That's not the, that's not, I mean, the, but the, the SAT solvers, I mean, we've worked hard to keep the size of the SAT query fixed, to keep it, you know, keep it bounded by a constant, essentially. And so the, the SAT queries, um, I don't think are the, are the, I shouldn't say I know for sure. I don't think that's the bottleneck. Uh, and 
the, you know, the, the, the real system engineering issue here for, for parallelizing it is the fact that we have this database and everything needs to get fed back into the database. And so you know, information does have to travel back and forth. But the big chunk of work that we can farm out independently is analyzing a single function. Right? That's a, just a very convenient unit to move out. So I guess one of the things about leaks is that um, the developer actually, in circumstances where they know that, for example, the process is going to exit anyway, they, they may choose not to not not to free something just because you know there's no point. They know they don't give up right. anyway. So do you have a sense of how many of these leaks actually resulted in steady loss of memory over time? Well, that's a very good question, um, and I don't have a great answer to that because, like most people who work on these kinds of tools, we don't know much about the applications we're analyzing, right? and and to you know, so there's no question that a fair number of these are serious um, leaks. Um, there's also no question that some of these are exactly what you said. I mean, these are leaks that, for whatever reason, they don't care about. All right. Um, you know, there's another class of problems. So this is by way of avoiding your question. Uh, to do, say, with region-based allocators or, or arena-based allocators. And, and those, uh, because of the free is a different kind of operation that frees a whole group of objects at once, uh, that's a potential source, an enormous source of po false positives, potentially. But we have some fairly clever ways of, of catching that in the system, Semant semantic ways of recognizing uh, arena-based allocators and just ignoring them, not trying to find leaks in, in that part, of, in, in those kinds of allocators. So. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I guess the real answer to your question is I don't know. I don't have a great answer to that. Um, in your log analysis, do you also check the situation where you fail to unlock? That's also like a resource uh, problem, right? Yeah. yeah, where you just fail to ever unlock it. Yeah, no, we, we don't look for that. We don't look for something where you just never, you never unlock it. The assumption is that eventually you'll use it again. I mean, since we're analyzing everything up to the, you know, to the top level of the program, that that uh, that that will eventually result in a double lock. Okay, that's that's generally how it how that will be manifested as a double lock error. Other questions? Any idea how sensitive this is to how far you unroll loops? You said you unroll them n times. Yeah. Right. Well, I can the, the probably the the most straightforward and honest answer to that is, but for locks, we unroll twice. Okay, on the assumption that. Since there's only two states, you know most errors will show up within two iterations. Uh, for 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 leaks, we found that two that three was better than two. Okay, <laughs> so we unroll three times in the leak checker. Four better than three. Not significantly, not significantly. Yeah, but that was definitely arrived at empirically. Yeah. yeah. No, no. So I have a question about how you actually run this thing. So. A lot of the other checkers you refer to, right, like mm -hmm. SNAP, ESP, whatever, they, they do data flow analysis and they work very operationally, right? You, you take the control flow graph, you're at a point, you have a state, you go to the next point, you have a state. Mm -hmm. Are you doing this the same way or are these formulas for a whole function being fed into the SAT solver and you get one answer? Yeah, yeah so, so the construction of the formula is done in, in, in a walk, in a, in a data flow style walk over the abstract syntax tree. Yeah. yeah, it's one scan. It's a linear, it's a linear scan if you want to think of it that way. I mean, we visit each node once, one, each abstract syntax tree node once, generate the formulas for that, and then we collect the entire formulas for the entire function, and then we issue these queries. Now, I have to say, the representation isn't quite what I showed you. I mean, I, I was showing you entire formulas for the state, but we keep track of more dependency information than that, so we can do the slicing at the end. Okay, so we, so how we construct that is actually important, um, quite important actually, because uh, that, that is one thing we know will mess up the SAT solver if you if you feed it the entire formula. You know, and, and I'll tell you one of the reasons we can get away with using a 32-bit adder, you know, a full 32-bit adder for our uh, for addition, is that when we do the slicing, you know, how many locks depend on addition? You know, probably a lot of that stuff is getting completely sliced away and never making it into the SAT solver. But, you know, if you are, for some reason, doing something every now and again, it gets in there and does the right thing. So they right. Try this we have talked about that. And Yichen is currently working on, uh, on some extensions to, to look at buffer overruns. Yeah. 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 Did the full adder ever end up in final form? That got we never check. 
We know we don't, we don't we haven't gone back and looked. No, it's not it's not that we're scared to look, it's just that there's a lot we could figure out that we haven't done, you know, to understand in detail, you know, what, what happened. Uh, I think for memory leak it probably shows up more often. You know, because there probably are some things that are you know, that where there are where is some arithmetic being used in deciding whether to make certain decisions. Generally you encode the state integers. Yeah. Why not just a bit vector some in the state or I'm not in you know? Well yeah, that they're they're encoded as yeah. So in fact, you know, these integers also get compiled into Boolean expressions. Yeah. So they're small integers. I mean it'll be you know, so. how many how many bits do you have if your state machine has four states? Do you have two bits or four bits? Well we'll use two bits for that. Yeah. So if we have four states we can represent you know, four states with two bits, right? Okay. I mean, that's not where we're using most of our bits, is in the representation of those finite states. Sure. To interpret the two bits, you've got more quads. That may well be. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, in fact, I'm speaking too quickly because I don't know. I mean, each and I discussed this once, and I don't know exactly what representation he chose. I assume that he's using. Uh, he may he may be using a bit vector, in fact, for that particular thing. Although when we discussed it, we were very concerned about the number of bits and more than the number of clauses. Okay, so but well, the lock one is the biggest one. It's only it's only a three state machine. Yeah. We haven't gone for really really. I mean, I don't I don't know of very many large finite state machine properties. Finite state machine properties actually use a lot of space. Okay, there was one that you guys had. So it was really yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That's the only example that I know of. Yeah, that's the only Presentation is specified with lots of other bits. It, it's specified as you know as a struct with four or five fields. So if you blow them up, it will be on the order of a few hundred states. Yeah. yeah. So let me just finish up quickly. Um, so I'm happy to take more questions, but let me finish the, the talk. So, uh, the, so the current work is extending this to a sound uh, but still scalable set-based analysis. And, and the first step there, um, because a lot of things depend on alias analysis, is to get a sound alias analysis in this framework. Right? And so Brian, uh, who's here I wanted to mention, has just finished a path, context, and object-sensitive set-based alias analysis. And what we use this for, um, we haven't actually used, incorporated this into any checkers yet. Um, but what we, we used it for was actually to conduct a study of how people actually use aliasing. So what do people actually use aliasing for? And, and so the false positive rate, the false aliasing rate with this analysis is only 20%. So you can actually go and look at all the instances of aliasing where aliasing is introduced in, in a million lines of code and classify them. And that's what, that's what Brian did over the last few months. Okay. So, so we've got that working um, and we've got, a, we got a, we, we've got it scaling up to millions of lines. But. Um, so why SAT revisited? Uh, well, okay, because we can. That's one reason for doing this. All right, because um, it's, it's become the algorithms for SAT and Moore's law has made it possible to actually use this as an engine. And and I have to say, as somebody who's worked in program analysis for a long time, you know, the the feeling of liberation and not having to worry about how to solve the constraints myself, okay, but let somebody else worry about that for a while, it's great. Okay, so I can, you know, because I always wind up when I when I go to work on these kinds of problems, you know. You, you come up with some nice formulation of the analysis, and the first problem is, well, how do I actually solve that? And then you spend all your time doing that rather than doing the analysis itself. Okay, so, so it's nice to spend some time actually um, doing the analyses and, and being able to rely on the, on the black box. Um, so the uniform modeling of constructs as bits, uh, you know, this, I think this is the, the reason that, that we've been able to go as far as we can with basically you know, one, uh, one, one or two grad students and one um, you know, advisor doesn't do any real work. Um, so we do, you know, mainly because we can delay the abstraction. So we don't have to, we don't actually lose information or lose very much information until we reach the abstraction boundary, uh, at, the, at function boundaries, excuse me. And finally, um, the fact that we're using constraints, the fact that we, you know, that, that there's no distinction between input and output is, is really useful in formulating these things. So if you noticed in the lock, in the leak, in the lock checker, I mean, the important property was an output property, a property on the return state of the function. And the fact that we can just build up a query that says, okay, I want, you know, 
all the computations of this function body where the return state is a particular value. Or, and if I wanted to, I could have plugged in a constraint on the input side as well. This makes it very easy to build this kind of scalable uh, analysis. All right. I have a question on the previous slide. Okay. Uh, Which one? This one? Yeah. Ah, we treat them as tail recursive functions. So basically, so basically, then and then and then to handle recursion, it's iterative. So we do compute points here. Yeah, we do compute fixed points here. Yeah, yeah. And so that was one of the things was figure out what a fixed point was for the particular summary we wanted in this case. Right, and there's more to it than that. I mean, there's there's more to this story that's different from the previous than from the rest of this talk that like, we could talk about. But but this is the three line summary in the context of this talk. Yeah. So, um, so what, what do you do with concurrence? Because I think some of the benchmarks are actually not. Yeah, well, we, we, yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. So that's, that would be, that would be a fair comment, I say, if we ignore concurrence. Yeah. I had an additional motivation for subs. I'm sorry? An additional motivation for subs, you, you may benefit since you say that the sub itself is not the bottleneck. Yeah. So you check uh, what happens when you run all sub solvers. And then you get, so all that solvers are not much harder than such even though it's sharpy, and you get all the counter examples. I see, I see. Yeah, uh, we haven't considered that. That is something we have not considered. Um, right. It can give you much more information because you already work hard and generate it. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible that we can make use of all sets on it. Other question. Actually, there's another question. What's the output of your tool? Do you actually show it? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we say bug, but then we give you the we give you the function summary database, and that's how you understand. I mean, that's actually how you go. That's how we debug. That's how we that's understand how the results. That's how we do it. Yeah. So we, we say, look, there's a bug on this line. I mean, this function has this problem. It returns this lock, and you know, it appears to double lock. And then we go and, and then we can you know look at that piece of code and understand it. And then we look at the function summaries to help understand the behavior of the callers. Right. And we could do more. I mean, I don't think I don't think it is necessarily the greatest thing in the world. But basically, the function summaries give you enough uh, of a of a kind of counterexample like facility that that we're able to to use it. And this is how people you know, when we give these to developers when we send these out to the like the kernel mailing list, then we see a whole bunch of hits come to the function summary database as people are trying to understand the bugs. Do you have more slides? Or? I, yeah, I have. No, 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 go ahead. I mean, this suggests to me what is the deep part for this kind of approach, which is you have some properties here that are very bottom up in nature. And that's why looking at a summary gives you the, the right answer. And you think the approach is exists to a very precise interpretation thing. You just abstract whatever you need that's enough for the caller, and you keep going up. Right? You know how you do properties uh, that are kind of going top down? Right. Well, what's an example of a top-down property? Um, uh, okay, great. Uh, so tainting analysis? Tainted analysis. See, I don't see why you can't do uh, well, I mean, a tainting analysis in this way. Right. Well, well, I don't see why you couldn't do it in a fairly good example. It's a much more natural forward flow top-down problem, right? In the process, you did something. Let's think about RHF. Mm -hmm. It's doing a top-down forward flow, and in the process, it's usually something that has to be right. right. Other questions? I don't want to, I feel like I've already overrun quite a bit, but I don't want to, but if people, but but happy. Okay. Which one? This one? This one. This one. Exact slide. This one. Okay. Yeah. 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 Rusman would use the same slide for ESP Java, right? And what he would say is his whole approach to, to doing analysis is you take a simple box like a tail proof, you model everything in terms of formulae, you produce one formula for the whole function based on the pre post feed it to the tail prover, you don't worry about who implemented it, how, and it's a great way of prototyping new checking. Right. 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 Well, I've always believed in the separation. You know, if you have like, some sort of resolution engine, and so there's a lot of arguments, you know, for that kind of separation. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, and I would probably agree with Ruston uh, on a lot of that. I mean, the the differences would be. Um, uh, well, the summaries. There's, there's there's the automation. I mean, the, how how much uh, user annotation is going to be required. 
uh, to make use of it in this way. All right? And for some parties, I think you are going to need user annotation. I mean, that's probably, that, that is where we're going. Um, you know, beyond, because for some properties, you're going to need, uh, you're going to need user hints. Right? And, but still, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm aware of some of the annotation work that's been done here, and obviously Brian, you know, brings that culture to us too. So you can sort of suspect, you know, the kind of uh, approach we're taking there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I already said this several times. And then here's my here's my related work slide. So you know, just trying to get everybody give everybody credit where credit is due. And I would particularly point out the other SAT-based tools um, that have been being done at uh, CMU recently. Okay, that's, uh, it's important to realize we're not the only ones who have been looking at this. So there is another uh, group or a couple of groups actually at CMU that are very interested in using SAP. Okay, and that's it. Uh, any other? No, I'll take questions. <laughs> so. Okay, thanks.